Good morning, everybody. Hope uh, that this day finds you well and, and at least partially immunized, if not completely vaccinated. Uh, it is a, quite a pleasure to have visitors from other departments. So uh, to start off, I'm going to tell you a little bit about our speaker today, Jenny Feng. Uh, I very much enjoyed reading your CV, Jenny. Um, you received your uh, BA in Biology and Neurosciences from Wash U, where you also were always on the Dean's List and got honors. You went on and did medical school uh, here, graduating in 2014. Jenny then went to Ohio Cleveland Clinic for her adult neurology uh, residency and continued on with a uh, research as well as MS in her clinical research from both Cleveland Clinic and Case Western Reserve University. She just joined us actually as an assistant professor faculty here in this past August with over 30 multiple sclerosis specific papers, more than 10 of which she is the first or senior author. I don't believe I've seen as much dedicated focused research in one area. So Jenny, I'm, I'm predicting that you are our regional expert in multiple sclerosis and you are also a young triple threat with lots of accolades uh, about not only your research, but your, your teaching and mentoring uh, so, and clinical uh, prowess. So it'll be our honor to hear what you have to teach us about multiple sclerosis and the research that you've done, to, done thus far. Thank you for the very kind induction. I, I don't think I'm uh, quite the uh, quite the triple threat, as you mentioned, but I'm making my way there. That will be my eventual goal, hopefully. Um, so happy to give this talk on multiple sclerosis overview and update on remyelination therapies today. Um, it, it's uh, really nice to return to, to University of Louisville as a faculty member, and I really did enjoy my time here as a medical student and truly enjoyed rotating through the internal medicine wards and clinics. So um, I, I really do appreciate the opportunity to be invited back to give the Grand Rounds talk on um, on a disease entity that's very, very um, dear to me, uh, very, very uh, interesting. And I do find that there's lots of lots of interesting research undergoing in terms of uh, future of treatment options. So um, just to get started, I have no disclosures or conflicts of interest. Um, our learning objective today will be to uh, uh, to evaluate the uh, basically the health and social economic impact of multiple sclerosis, understand the current diagnostic criteria that were used for multiple sclerosis, and recognize the available FDA approved therapies for treatment right now, um, and also understand the need and barriers to remyelination in multiple sclerosis, and also recognize some of the potential uh, interesting investigational uh, remyelination compounds that are currently um, currently under investigation and uh, possibly FDA approval in the near future. So just to give you a little bit background on multiple sclerosis, um, it is a chronic immune-mediated neurodegenerative disease of the central nervous system. So MS is one of the most common non-traumatic causes of disability in young adults. It used to be the most common, but with a recent event of disease-modifying therapies, now it's becoming the, one of the most common, but no longer on the top of the leaderboard. Um, and uh, multiple sclerosis, the onset of symptoms, usually between 20 to 40 years old. The age of the actual disease onset is unclear, but presumably sometime before the symptom onset. And the transition from a relapsing phenotype to a more progressive phenotype usually occurs sometimes about 10 to 20 years after the onset of symptoms. The MS is female predominant uh, with female to male ratio about three to one. And prevalence right now in the, in, uh, uh, in the United States is about three to four out of a thousand. So it's a quite common disease, about one in every 300 to 400 patients. Um, and currently in the U.S., there are about a million people living with MS and about three to four million people worldwide living with MS. And the incidence um, is actually increasing worldwide, uh, especially in females. Um, and uh, MS is more common in Caucasians uh, and less common in African Americans and Hispanics in the United States, but, uh, but they do have worse outcomes. The variability in terms of a disease course and progression um, is usually dependent on a couple different factors. Um, so there's environmental factors, uh, individuals prior exposure to infections, toxins, their diet, their gut microbiome variability, 
and also each individual's comorbidities. For example, those with a metabolic syndrome will have a higher cellular stress and that may affect their disease progression in terms of multiple sclerosis. And also genetics, the interplay between various immune uh, mitochondrial and uh, axonal function genes that, that may predict an, uh, one's disease course and outcome. So we know that MS is a very costly disease, and when disability goes up, the quality of life goes down, and the workforce participation for these young adults obviously goes down as well. So per patient annually, at least right now in the U.S., uh, it's about $8,000 to $50,000 per patient in, uh, for annual direct and indirect healthcare costs. And most patients uh, lie in the upper end of that range. You can see this graph here. Uh, most of that cost actually goes into disease-modifying therapies, and the other portion goes into you know, the frequent imaging that they get and also the professional services, such as infusions and nursing support. Um, and the annual uh, economic cost, uh, which includes direct healthcare costs and the loss of productivity for these patients, is about $10 billion in the U.S. So it's a very, very costly disease, and that's why um, the drive to, uh, to come up with better disease-modifying therapies and uh, medicine to reverse the disability is of utmost importance. So for those of you who are interested in history, um, <clears throat> MS is actually described uh, first by the French neurologist Charcot back in 1868. Uh, he described that uh, he, there are these patients with these sclerosis plaques in the periventricular regions, in the pons, and also in the spinal cord that he has noticed. And he'd coined these uh, pa patients with uh, something called sclerosis in plaque, which nowadays we know as multiple sclerosis. And we also know that nowadays there can be plaques in the optic nerve as well, um, in the juxtacortical regions of the brain, uh, in the cerebral Bellum also in the brain stem. So multiple, multiple sclerosis starts out as an uh, inf uh, perivenular inflammation that are mediated by adaptive uh, and the innate immune system. So together, these responses contribute to disease initiation, which can be characterized by demyelination. Um, and, but eventually, uh, the disease will progress into axonal loss, where you have irreversible damage. And this is a major contributor to the irreversible uh, disability in most patients incurs towards the end of the disease. And pictures here just shows you what um, these paraventricular lesions may look like on the T2 hyperintense uh, hyper lesions on the MRI of the brain, and over here on the spinal cord cross section, and also here on the uh, demyelinated lesions in the uh, lateral portion of the spinal cord. And demyelination, just a little bit about how, um, how, how, you know, how it leads from demyelination to axonal damage. So we know that when starting out, you have these uh, microglial cells, macrophages, and lymphocytes that leads to inflammatory demyelination in which they cause oligodendrocyte uh, damage and loss, and uh, also uh, lead to myelin sheath damage. And over here, you will have exposed axons, which uh, you will lose the saltatory conductions that you typically would see in a healthy and the healthy myelinated axon. And the loss of saltatory conduction uh, is due to the uh, redistribution and the loss in the sodium, uh, voltage-gated sodium and the potassium channels. And that leads to altered trans energy transport and then eventually energy failure due to the increased demand uh, as well. So then uh, the loss of myelin sheath around these axons, um, you know, with, with their loss, you lose the physical and the trophic support by these, uh, by these sheath, and that leads to exposed axons, which can uh, incur further damage. So you can have physical damage, metabolic damage, oxidative, oxidative damage to the, to the axons, and that eventually will lead to neuronal damage and neurodegeneration. And like I said earlier, this part is irreversible. So now, just to touch a little bit on the diagnosis of MS. So diagnosis of MS is uh, uh, characterized by the concept that MS is a, a dissemination in space and time. To reiterate that MS is a multifocal disease that evolves over time. And given that there's no better explanation to explain the patient's symptoms or radiographic findings, and the patient must have clinical manifestations as well as radiographic uh, changes that are seeing MS. So here is an image of a patient with cl uh, classic periventricular MS lesions that sometimes do enhance with contrast. 
And then going to the next page is a uh, our 2017 McDonald criteria. So this is the most recently published McDonald criteria. I imagine there's probably be another update in about two years or so. Um, this criteria focuses on the fact that um, to to be able to diagnose MS, you must have clinical attacks. And you can either have clinical attacks that are separated by time, meaning you have an attack, for example, a year ago, now you have another attack. So this demonstrates dissemination in time and that satisfies that part of the criteria. And to demonstrate dissemination in space, you, you either must have MRI lesions that are you know, in different parts of the, uh, uh, the, the brain or the spinal cord, or you can have clinical evidence of two lesions based on your clinical exam. So if you localize a lesion based on your exam to the, you know, the, the spinal cord, for example, and you localize another lesion to you know, possibly cerebellum, and then that satisfies the criteria. Um, so in addition to that, um, having a scan is important uh, in that you can also demonstrate dissemination in time by having both enhancing and non-enhancing lesions to show that there's different ages to the lesions. And to, with that, you can also demonstrate the, the, the dissemination time concept. And for patients, um, actually before I go into that, here's some pictures of what the typical classic MS lesions look like. So over here you have these paraventricular lesions on the, uh, on the sagittal cut of the brain. Um, the, these are actually on top on the spine, uh, on the corpus callosum. And then you can have juxtacortical lesions like showing here in panel A. And then you can have infratentorial lesions, so lesions that are in the brainstem or the cerebellum. Here is showing you a lesion in the pons. And then you can have lesions in the spinal cord, such as shown here in panel D. And then panel E just shows you what, in, in, uh, what a, a contrast enhancing lesion looks like on a post-con T1 image. So these are all the areas where MS lesions occur. And I, um, what's not shown here is also lesions. You can have lesions in the optic nerve. So sometimes you can see that on, uh, on T2 images in the axial cut better. And here is what I meant by um, both the, uh, in both the uh, appearance of non-enhancing lesions and enhancing lesions. So here's on the uh, cut of the MRI, you can see that there are some lesions that are not enhancing, and then after giving contrast, there's an enhancing lesion. So these are obviously of different ages. So with just one scan, you can show dissemination in time. And also, um, if for, some, for somebody who may not have um, contrast, you can have a lesion here at baseline and then scan them a couple months later, showing you that there's two more new lesions that also satisfies the dissemination in time criteria. So with a new updated uh, McDonald criteria, it makes it much easier to much easier and much uh, to diagnose MS early. So you can uh, potentially diagnose MS just based on one clinical visit and one scan. And in patients who possibly uh, do not have the dissemination in time criteria, for example, they come to you with just one uh, clinical event, um, and also in imaging, you just have a uh, you know evidence of a couple non-enhancing lesions um, and you want to diagnose MS early rather than wait for another scan or another clinical event, for example, you have the option of obtaining a cerebral spinal fluid analysis. So that is the newest um, addition to the 2017 McDonald criteria that makes it easier to diagnose MS early. So in these patients, you can obtain a CSF analysis and to send for oligoclonal bands. For those that have oligoclonal bands that are uniquely distributed in the cerebral spinal fluid, as shown in these two panels here on the right, um, that uh, satisfies the diagnostic criteria. You can use this in place of dissemination in time. So here you can see that in the serum, there are no bands, but in the CSF, you have a bunch of bands. Or in the serum, there are some bands, but in the CSF, there's a few extra bands. So for the, oh, oops. Uh, yeah, so for, uh, so for these two panels, um, so that is more commonly seen in MS. So 95% of MS patients will have oligoclonal bands. Um, and, uh, and obviously the testing um, accuracy depends on some technical factors as well. So always keep that in mind. And also in patients who may have a, you know, for example, a systemic inflammatory disease, um, you may have identical bands in the serum and in the cerebral spinal fluid, but because there's no unique bands, you can't diagnose this patient with MS just because they have bands. They must have unique oligoclonal bands to satisfy the criteria. All right, so moving on to some of the other ancillary studies. So these are not part of the official diagnostic criteria, but we sometimes use them in the MS clinic to support uh, one's diagnosis if there were some elements that we're unsure about. So for example, OCT, which is optic 
optical, optical coherence tomography. You can use that to identify retinal nerve fiber uh, layer thinning, and that can use to suggest the prior optic nerve involvement in the and also uh, electrophysiologic tests such as the evoked potentials that can demonstrate subclinical involvement as well in the sensory pathway. So visual evoked potential is probably the most commonly used one. And then on top of that, you can have brainstem auditory potentials and the somatosensory pathway potential that can help you to demonstrate subclinical involvement. And then there's a central vein sign, which is somewhat of a uh, more of a novel entity um, that can be seen on higher field MRI. So usually three Tesla scans or seven Tesla scans that demonstrate a vein that goes right through the center of a NAMAS lesion. And for a patient with mo um, with lesions that uh, have a predominant central vein sign that is shown to have correlation with a more uh, likely MS diagnosis than patients who have migraines, for example. And also CSF uh, neurofilament light chains have been found to be higher in MS patients compared to healthy controls. So that has been used also as a supportive ancillary study in some of the clinical trials. We have, we're not doing that in the clinic yet, but in the clinical trials that has definitely been included as one of the outcome markers. Um, and to consider MS, you must consider the differentials. Like I said, the McDonald criteria um, has um, is used in patients who have Classic presenting, uh, classically presenting symptoms, uh, rather than uh, patients with you know some non-specific or uh, systemic symptoms that are not unique to MS. So for those patients, you must consider the other possibilities of what it may be. So there's a bunch of vascular causes that can mimic the look of MS, um, and there's inflammatory and other autoimmune causes that are not MS. Uh, there's infectious, uh, infectious causes, and uh, in the correct patient with the correct family history, you can also sometimes find genetic causes as well. Um, and metabolic causes such as thyroid B12 deficiency, those can be easily ruled out with simple blood, blood work. Um, neoplastic causes, and also uh, unique causes within the spine that can mimic the look of MS. So all of these you must consider um, when looking at a patient uh, with you know, the classic symptoms and also the scans. And also you can kind of further uh, narrow down your differential based on the presentation of the patient's symptoms. For example, if they're presenting with acute optic neuritis, uh, it could be MS, but sometimes it could also be uh, neuromyelitis, neuromyelitis optica, could be Leber's optic neuropathy, um, some toxic nutritional causes, or uh, anterior ischemic optic neuropathy, the more the vascular causes. Um, in patients with transverse myelitis, for example, you can have also a series of causes that can, uh, that can uh, localize to that region of the spinal cord. And for patients with more polysymptomatic um, uh, symptoms, uh, and also on the MRI, you can sometimes differentiate between MS versus somebody who has a stroke, for example, versus somebody who has sarcoidosis or catacel, which is the genetic uh, uh, cause for multi multifocal strokes. And then uh, for uh, lesions that are seen in the brainstem or the cerebellum, you have another uh, you know, unique set of uh, differentials that you must consider. So overall, I won't go into too much detail about how to differentiate these diseases, but just something to keep in mind when you see a MS, uh, possible MS patient that you don't forget to at least rule out some of these other common causes as well. Um, so there's some red flags that, you, um, that, that may point you to something else other than MS. For example, older age, um, it's, it's uh, less likely that somebody who is 70 years old presenting with an acute relapse, um, that's unlikely to be MS, then you probably would consider something like stroke, uh, for example, in somebody with the correct vascular risk factors. And also in patients who are living areas of low prevalence or those who are ethnic minorities, um, you also must keep the differential in mind because MS is less common in these groups. Um, in terms of symptoms, patients with systemic or constitutional symptoms or symptoms that suggest a peripheral nerve disorder in, uh, or patients with no symptoms at all, you must consider things that are not MS. And patients with uncommon symptoms, for example, bilateral optic neuritis um, or complete ophthalmoplegia, complete myelopathies or patients with confusion, encephalopathy, um, meningismus signs, those you definitely need to do further workup uh, uh, before diagnosing with MS. <clears throat> In an MRI, um, you can have nonspecific lesions. Um, for example, you, the small uh, microvascular changes that you might see in patients with uh, diabetes, hypertension. Um, in patients with migraines, you can also have small punctate nonspecific lesions. Um, in patients with persistent lesion enhancement or hemorrhage or longitudinally extensive lesions, those are typically not MS, but rather something else. And also, um, in 
in MS patients and also a bunch of other um, diseases that may have similar uh, common symptoms, but they're rather nonspecific. So fatigue, um, dizziness, bladder incontinence, and headaches, those are commonly seen in MS, but they're fairly nonspecific, and we cannot use those two as part of the clinical diagnostic criteria for MS. So in, a lot of times in patients with, you know, these red flags or, you know, some um, unclear symptoms or uh, the, the imaging may look fairly nonspecific, I have a low threshold for obtaining spinal cord MRI and or cerebral spinal fluid analysis because this can certainly help with increasing the specificity and sensitivity of, uh, of these studies to diagnose MS. All right, now shifting gear a little bit, I'm just going to briefly touch on the disease-modifying therapies that we have available right now. So disease-modifying therapies, um, that's the mainstay, the hallmark treatment for MS, in that they reduce the number and severity of clinical relapses. They prevent the accumulation of disability by preventing these relapses. Um, they prevent new lesions, and uh, they also shorten the duration of relapses and improve recovery. Um, so right now we have a bunch of disease-modifying therapies that are very good at targeting the inflammatory component of MS, but we don't have any therapy that can reverse disability. We don't have any therapy that remyelinate, and we don't have any therapies that neuroprotect. And uh, in terms of the currently available FDA-approved uh, MS therapies, you can see that the number kind of exploded in the past 10 years or so. Initially, people were only on some kind of, you know, interferon therapy in the 1990s. And then after 2000, there's explosion of therapies, especially the monoclonal antibodies that has been, I would say, the most popular treatment that we use nowadays in our MS clinic. Um, and, uh, and then on here, there's a couple more in, that came out in 2000 that uh, I couldn't, uh, that, you know, can be fit on this graph. But um, in 2000, you can see that there's also a bunch, a bunch of new ones that came out. So there's more than enough options for the MS patient to, uh, to fit their need in terms of, you know, the side effect profile, the tolerability to medication, and administrative route and frequency. So they can really tailor therapy to fit the patient's needs based on, based on their uh, clinical characteristics and also their preferences. And uh, all of these therapies, they work differently. So do you have the immunomodulators, uh, for example, the interferons, the, uh, the dimethylfumarate, glutarimal acetate. And then you have those that inhibit cell replication. Uh, we actually don't use mitoxantral anymore because it's rather an old therapy. But albagio, teriflutamide, we sometimes still use in clinic. Um, and then there, the cell depleters, like I said, are the most common ones that are probably used in, in clinic nowadays. It's ocrelizumab, it's an anti-CD20 medication um, that depletes the B cells. Um, so, and then alentuzumab, cladribine, and ofatumumab, but all in that cell depleter category. And then you have medications that alter cell trafficking. So you have the, the MODs, the fingolimod, the panamod, the xanamod. Basically, they trap the lymphocytes inside the lymph node and prevent the egression of them into the, into the peripheral uh, circulation. And then you have natalizumab, which is tisabri, that prevents the entry of these uh, lymphocytes into the CNS, so in turn prevents uh, the inflammation that you see in MS. So all of these um, medications, they work differently. So for some patients, maybe one will work. For some other patient, another one will work better. But usually, we consider the, um, the, the cell depleters and also natalizumab to be ones that are higher efficacy. And then some of the oral medications, the MODs, um, they're uh, considered medium efficacy. And then the interferons, the glutamyl acetate, uh, which is Copaxone, we consider them to be low efficacy. And we don't use them as often nowadays because we have all these other higher efficacy drugs now. And then, so the general concept for treatment is that we prefer earlier treatment. Um, after diagnosis of um, uh, after a diagnosis, we usually like to start patient treatment right away, um, because uh, most relapsing remitting MS patients it will progress from a relapsing phenotype into a secondary progressive phenotype within 10 to 15 years after onset of their disease if they go without treatment. Um, so if they do go on treatment, that time course is obviously extended. So you have longer period of time if, uh, before you accrue irreversible disability. Um, so the, uh, putting them on early disease-modifying therapies, you can potentially slow down progression. Um, but like I said, we don't have therapy right now to reverse the progression. So prevention is the key right now. Um, and we don't also we also don't really have reliable prognostic markers to predict who will progress faster and who won't, who will be a better responder to therapy versus those that who don't. So those are also active areas of, um, of research. 
And uh, on top of symptomatic, uh, on top of disease modifying therapy, you have to consider sy symptomatic therapy for patients. You know, they have have urinary incontinence issues, can have pain, spasms, spasticity. Those also must be addressed. Um, you also have to treat the comorbidities as well, which is why we work closely with the primary care physicians to, to make sure the patients, you know, for example, diabetes controlled, hypertension is controlled, because we know those can, can cause irreversible cerebral damage as well. Um, and then we also promote a healthy lifestyle wellness because all of those features such as smoking cessation, exercise, a healthier diet, they maximize the cerebral reserve that could protect these patients from future relapses. So going on, shifting gear now to some of the remyelinating therapies that are under uh, investigation. So like I said, we don't have any FDA-approved therapies right now, but, um, but there are a bunch of med, uh, uh, you know, agents that are being investigated for their remyelinating potential. And before I talk about those, I want to talk about how remyelination occurs. So, um, and, and we know that the, there's, current, there's a current need for remyelinating therapies because we, uh, there's significant medical and socioeconomic burden that's driven by the accumulating and irreversible disability. So we really do need to prevent disability progression as a key in the next step of treating MS. So here's how remyelination occurs. Um, so remyelination naturally occurs in our, um, in, in our brains uh, that's mediated by oligodendrocyte progenitor cells, or OPCs, and sometimes by mature oligodendrocytes as well to a lesser degree. Um, so these oligodendrocyte precursor cells, they improve uh, conduction velocity by providing, uh, by, providing re uh, by remyelinating essentially, and they provide physical and trophic support, and they promote a healthier um, environment that is, uh, um, that is supportive of neuroprotection as well. So the OPCs, um, they are pretty abundant in the adult brain um, and also early in the disease course, but as one age, our number of OPCs goes down, and also as one, as one age, the, the function of the OPCs became less, becomes less effective. And OPCs, um, they, they, they occur early in the MS disease course, like I said, was saying earlier, but as the disease progresses, the OPCs um, become less abundant and more dysfunctional. Um, so remyelination, it can occur in all stages of disease, but eventually um, the, the remyelinating mechanism become inadequate against the chronic inflammation that's continuingly in MS. So over here on the right-hand side, just basically showing you some uh, what remyelination looks like. So these are all cross-sections of axons that have been remyelinated. You can see that the, uh, the remyelinating ones are very thin, and, and the, the thickness of these myelin around the axons are very uh, irregular. So you know that um, remyelination, it happens, but it doesn't restore the, the, the neuronal unit to its pre um, uh, pre uh, attack phase, um, in that the patients they don't have they can't return to their baseline. So, so in a sense, there is irreversible damage here, despite the remyelination. All right. Um, so there are some barriers to successful remyelination. So, like I mentioned, MS is a chronic inflammatory disease. So there's a hostile inflammatory environment that is ongoing throughout the throughout the course of the disease that inhibits remyelination. And there also there have there's axonal damage that occurs. So it's very obviously very diff difficult to uh, remyelinate a damaged axon versus remyelinating a rather healthy axon. Um, there's physical barriers as well. So gliosis, the cellular debris that occurs after an acute uh, acute relapse. Um, so those all impede the migration of the logodendrocytes to the lesion site to, 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 uh, to have remyelination occur. Um, and then there's ineffective uh, OPC function, and also there's inadequate number of cells that can, uh, that can adequately remyelinate an entire length of an axon. So, um, so all of these together, they contribute to uh, the, the, the damage that patients see, that you see clinically with the disability. So over here on the right-hand side is a really cool paper that was published a couple of years ago showing you uh, on higher field MRI, so seven Tesla scans. When they looked at these lesions, there's a rim of paramagnetic iron rim that basically correlates with the chronic inflammation. So that shows, and then that's apparent almost all the lesions. That shows you that this chronic, slow, uh, smoldering inflammation that happens um, even after a lesion is no longer enhancing, and this is what's thought to be impeding the remyelinating process.
So to have a successful remyelination, you obviously would need the oligodendrocyte uh, precursor cells to mature uh, successfully into oligodendrocytes. And you have to also promote the successful migration of these oligodendrocyte precursor cells to the uh, to the site of the lesion. You have to enhance their function and also create a favorable remyelinating environment. Um, and you have to decrease the obstacles. So for example, suppressing the signaling pathways of the reactive or toxic astro size and also the neurotoxic microglial pathways that sometimes make remyelination difficult and you have to promote axonal survival and possibly rescue the damaged axons to make them to 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 prime them to be more uh, to be uh, to be more uh, favorable condition in favorable conditions for remyelination. So there's multiple different ways that um, that uh, that the MS field is looking at in terms of agents that do these specific things. And so now we're going to talk about some of these potential agents. So, um, so, so the discovery of compounds is um, pretty complex, as you all know. To to create a compound specifically for one function, um, it often takes years, if not a uh, you know, number of years and decades for that to make it even into like a phase one or phase two study. So um, there's some key molecular pathways that have been identified in the oligodendrocyte precursor cell in their maturation to oligodendrocytes. And there are a bunch of inhibitory factors that can be inhibited um, to, to promote that process. Or And also there are a number of factors that promote this process and they can be further enhanced enhanced or amplified to promote this maturation process. So all of these agents are under you know, current investigation, and obviously only some of them makes it out to a phase one study. But, uh, but just letting uh, you know to see the, to the range, of, uh, range of compounds that have been uh, or are currently under investigation. And uh, to screen compounds, um, there's obviously, you have all of these compounds and uh, you need a more effective way to screen them to, uh, to, to, to uh, arrive at a possible remyelinating uh, drug that can be used in clinical trials. So there's different ways um, that researchers have, have found to screen higher number of compounds in shorter amount of time. So there's, uh, so I'm only gonna focus on this really cool one here in the right hand lower corner, which is a micropillar array. And it's a high throughput, uh, throughput screening uh, uh, method. Basically um, these micropillar arrays are created um, to create it on, uh, uh, to, to basically use, you can quantify the actual myelin that's wrapped around by these oligodendrocytes or oligodendrocyte precursor cells as seen here. And then basically they apply agents to these micropillar arrays and whichever agent that induces the number of, the highest number of uh, myelin that wraps around these arrays are, you, uh, are selected as potential compounds that can be further developed into remyelinating agents. So that's a really cool method. Um, and then some, and you will see that some of these compounds we talk we talk about later in this talk are directly uh, are directly screened using this high throughput uh, method. And also there are some animal models that have been found to be helpful for screening uh, for remyelinating compounds, but obviously these are more costly and may take more time. So here are all the um, all the current compounds that are in phase two clinical trials, and then some of them uh, have been shown to be helpful. So here's a list of all of these um, things that we will talk about in more detail over the next couple of slides. But uh, you can see that these compounds they have different mechanisms of action, and then they have been tested on patient. Um, uh, patient with different uh, phenol phenotypes. For example, some were tested on patients with re relapsing MS, and some were tested in patients with progressive MS, some were tested in patients with optic neuritis, and then their outcome measures are also very different amongst these trials. So the first one I'm going to briefly mention is clemastine. Um, it's an antihistamine agent that you may have seen in, uh, you know, in the past. Um, it promotes endogenous uh, oligodendrocyte precursor function. So it was tested in a rebuild tr uh, trial called Rebuild, which basically um, it's a phase two placebo controlled trial looking at uh, the effect of clemastine on patients with chronic optic neuropathy in the study of relapsing MS. And they looked at improvements in visual evoke potentials. And it has been found to have a non-significant um, positive trend in clinical outcome measure, um, also a, uh, an in, uh, basic improvement in the visual evoke potentials in patients who are on the clemastine group versus the patient who are on 
uh, placebo group. Um, and there's an ongoing trial looking at patients with acute optic neuritis with the same outcome measures, and that is currently ongoing. And opacinumab is a anti-lingo-1 monoclonal antibody. If you remember, uh, lingo-1 uh, in a couple of slides ago is an adhesion molecule that inhibits the maturation from OPC to a mature oligodendrocyte. So by inhibiting this lingo-1 compound, you promote remyelination. Um, it has been tested in two separate um, phase two clinical trials, looking also uh, enrolling, so the first one enrolled patients with acute optic neuritis, and that have shown that uh, there's some improvement in the visual evoke potentials um, in, in, uh, in the primary analysis, but the benefit may, uh, is not as profound in the intention to treat analysis. Um, and in another separate trial, looking at patients with relapsing or secondary progressive MS, um, they looked at three-month confirmed disability improvement, so a clinical outcome marker, and that also showed no significant linear dose response. But uh, there may be some, uh, but there's an invert, uh, inverted U-shaped dose response with opacinumab. So now another trial is undergoing to look at um, the, the dose that uh, did promote, uh, did have some uh, benefit on the disability to see if we can further um, you know, investigate this further. Um, and next. Um, compound is timolimumab. It's a monoclonal antibody against the human endogenous retrovirus envelope protein. Um, basically, it's, uh, it it's also promotes the oligodendrocyte precursor cell differentiation. That had been shown in the phase two trial um, that's placebo-controlled uh, enrolled patient with relapsing MS. Um, basically, it showed that there was no significant change in inflammatory measures, whether it's MRI or clinical, but in some of the exploratory MRI uh, findings, the the, uh, they, they have been found to have some difference. So that's a potential role that maybe just needs a more, a better outcome marker to, to evaluate in a separate trial. And another compound, the GSK239-512, it's a histamine uh, H3 receptor blocker that also came from one of these high throughput screening methods. Um, so it enhances remyelination and has been also tested in a phase two trial in real patient re relapsing MS. And that has some positive effects on a uh, exploratory MRI marker. So there's also some potential there. Um, and another, uh, uh, compound is high dose biotin, which you may have heard in the past couple of years uh, gaining attraction because it was found to have improved disability measures in patients with uh, primary uh, uh, progressive MS. However, um, an another trial that uh, was done later, uh, a placebo controlled large phase three trial uh, enrolling patients with primary progressive MS that showed that there was no confirmed disability improvement. And actually, there may be a little bit increase in terms of side effects and adverse events in the in the in the trial group. So nowadays we don't encourage use the use of high dose biotin anymore as opposed to before. Um, it, and also with high dose biotin, you can have laboratory abnormalities because of that. And also there's a question of whether there's an increased relapse in patients who are on high dose biotin. So we don't have so we don't recommend this anymore. And uh, simvastatin, uh, it's a, uh, as many of you are familiar, is a HMG CoA reductase inhibitor. Uh, traditionally uh, used to treat hypercholesterolemia, but it's also found to stimulate uh, oligodendrocyte precursor survival and differentiation. So it's been shown in a prior uh, a, a prior clinical trial as an add-on therapy to interferons, in that a, a, it was found to uh, found to uh, improve uh, atrophy rate, um, brain volume atrophy rate over time. It has no significant effect on the annual relapse rate, but some effects on brain atrophy rate. And in another trial, uh, uh, MS-STAT, which is a placebo-controlled phase two trial, looking at high-dose simvastatin, 80 milligrams compared to placebo um, in secondary progressive MS patients, is shown also shown significant reduction in the annual atrophy rate, um, and also a small but significant effect in uh, slowing down disability. So, um, so, so for this reason, we in patients who are who do have progressive MS who um, you know, ha also have hypercholesterolemia, sometimes we do recommend um, them taking simvastatin instead because it has some effects and disability measures and also atrophy. 
And then mesocomal stem cells, which is another hot topic that you might have seen in the news. Um, so these are pluripotent uh, non-hematopoietic precursor cells that are aspirated usually from the bone marrow, can sometimes also be derived from the adipose tissue. So they also have been found to have various roles in enhancing repair and neuroprotection. So there's a multiple small um, clinical trials ongoing to look at um, to look at the effect of mesenchymal stem cells on various clinical and MRI measures. So the results of those should be out in the next couple of years. Um, so this is something to look out for because it has been very promising based on the preclinical studies. So, and then on top of all those agents that I mentioned, there's a bunch of pending or ongoing trials looking at other re potential remyelinating compounds. So um, all of these trials that listed here, they're either actively ongoing recruitment or planning to start. Um, so just, uh, just to show you how exciting the world of remyelination is because there's lots of research undergoing in, in this direction. Right now, you know, we have more than enough uh, remyelinating uh, sorry, more than enough therapies for relapsing MS, so the medications that stops relapses, uh, cures inflammation. Um, but now the, sh the gear has been shifted to looking at compounds for remyelination and uh, neuroprotection. So in conclusion, uh, sorry, when pretty fast, but in conclusion, uh, MS is one of the, um, again, MS is one of the most common causes for disability in young adults, and the diagnosis is based on demonstrating the concept of dissemination in space and time, and uh, I hope I have shown you that the diagnosis of MS is not always straightforward, and we should always be considering the alternative causes and ruling them out prior to confirming the MS diagnosis, especially in patients with you know, red flag symptoms or MRI findings. And significant strides have been made in terms of treating the inflammatory component of disease. We have more than a dozen, close to 20 something, uh, FDA approved agents now that are disease modifying in that they stop the future of stop future relapses, stop future disability progression. But now um, there's a major unmet unne um, need in terms of the progressive MS patients in which you have irreversible neurodegeneration. So there's um, a, a bunch of compounds that with either um, direct or indirect remyelinating potential um, that have been identified and are currently undergoing investigational studies and all in various phases of uh, clinical testing. So, um, so there's lots of good news in the MS world and I'm very encouraged by the current progress of all, um, all these agents uh, and also the you know, the research looking into understanding why remyelination occurs and how remyelination, um, you know, how remyelination is occurring and also neuroprotective agents as well. So future directions, um, you know, there's going to be more translational research that you're going to see in the um, and on, on PubMed with regards to looking at agents that are identified through these high throughput screening methods to clinical trials. And there's going to be a lot more trials uh, looking at that are designed specifically to evaluate remyelination in the, in the works. Um, so I want to thank my uh, fellowship mentors um, and also the Neurology Department Chair, Dr. Karen Remo, for being very supportive since my, uh, since my start here in the, in the MS clinic. And also my UofL MS team, Drs. David Robertson, Michael Sweeney, our MP Sarah King, our MS coordinator, Jacinta Lockard, and our RNs, Tammy Moore and Rosalind Phillips, and also our MS pharmacist, Emily O'Reilly, and of course all the MS patients who make all of this possible. And I included my contact information down here. So if you have any questions, feel free to contact me or find me on Twitter. I think I have some time for questions. Well, thank you, Dr. Feng. And um, if anyone has a question, you can, uh, you can unmute your mic and ask it. Also, if you would like, you could type it in the chat area. And actually, we do actually have a couple of questions in the chat area. The first one, and I'm gonna, I'll read these as they're typed, as verbatim. Uh, it is, uh, what if known is the antigen targets that initiates inflammation? So, um, so there's a couple different ones actually. Um, so there's a uh, there's a lot of myelin-specific antigen target, um, and uh, and there's also some axonal and neuronal antigen targets. So there's no specific one that has been shown to be uniform across all MS patients, but we know there's various um, you know antigen targets either within the myelin itself or on the axons themselves that um, that that lead to this kind of autoimmune inflammatory attack. All right, and we have another question. Uh, are there any predictors of which patients will respond to which agents? 
Yeah, so right now we don't have those uh, specific um, biomarkers, um, but there's some clinical, um, but, it, but in the clinic itself, I mean, there's, um, we use various clinical factors that help us, may help us predict response. So we know that patients with more aggressive relapses, patients with more frequent relapses, or patients with more aggressive imaging findings, um, they may be a poor responder to therapy. And for those patients, we typically start them on one of the higher efficacy therapies, for example, Tysagri or Ocrelizumab, um, uh, rather than uh, starting them on one of the lower efficacy therapies. So there are some clinical uh, features that we, we look at, but in type of specific very predictable and reliable biomarkers that, um, that is still um, you know, an area of active research. All right, anyone else have a question? Again, you can uh, unmute your mic and ask, or again, you could type in the chat area and we'll read it for Dr. Fang. Jenny, I have a question uh, before Dr. Emens talks about microbiota. <laughs> Being in GI and one of your initial slides commented on the microbiota. As, as you probably know, uh, there is FDA approved fecal microbial transplant mm -hmm. for C. difficile infection that's uh, recurring or relapsing, um, donors are not allowed to have any neurodegenerative history, no MS, no Parkinson's, et cetera. And so then at the same time when these clinical trials for C. diff were being performed, as you're aware, some uh, transplants actually improved the condition in MS. So although it's a, a huge type of transplant with multiple different viruses and things, What's your take on that? And do you think there will be active ongoing clinical research looking at uh, microbial transplant as treatment for MS? There's definitely a, a, a field, in, uh, a group in, uh, in within MS world that's working on looking at microbial transplants, and we know that the the gut um, microbiome, gut and brain connection is definitely there. Like you mentioned, um, in MS patients, there have been found to have different, uh, you know, gut microbiome composition compared to healthy controls, and also um, there have been research looking at microbiome markers as potentially um, uh, predictors for disease. For example, patients with, you know, a more more progressive phenotype versus patients with more active relapsing phenotype, their microbiome compositions have been found to be different. Um, in terms of actual, um, you know, a therapeutic agents to, to, uh, to, to look into uh, treating the inflammatory component of MS or possible neurodegenerative component, I think that is still um, maybe uh, uh, maybe not as uh, developed quite yet because, uh, you know, to design a trial and also to have the correct uh, uh, outcome markers to detect remyelination, to demonstrate that, you know, like a, a significant clinical or, or MRI uh, biomarker change, and that is quite difficult even for some of these other compounds that I have mentioned. So, um, so in terms of microbiome treatment for MS, there's definitely uh, work underway, but um, uh, and it's not close to having any um, any FDA-approved agents yet. Thank you. Thanks for that prescient comment, Dr. Kruger. But I was going to actually ask not just about the microbiome transplants, but regular stem cell transplants and what your comment might be about how those you are used these days. There are uh, more than three uh, trials now that have been done that have shown some effect on the rapidly progressive MS, and I wondered if you had any comments about the resetting of the immune system with autotransplant or the limited trials for allotransplant to cure this. Yeah, so the so the autologous stem cells have been um, considered actually one of the probably the most um, efficacious um, uh, treatment, avail treatment option available. Um, so. Uh, you know, we can, there's actually a trial actively undergoing called Beat MS in some centers within the U.S. that's comparing the um, the uh, effect of autologous uh, stem cell transplant uh, versus the higher efficacy drugs for the Ocrevus and Tysabri in patients with aggressive uh, relapsing MS. So that trial is undergoing directly comparing these agents head to head in terms of um, you know uh, outcome measures in both clinical and, and MRI and also laboratory values. So we consider um, so even though it's not FDA approved yet, um, we do consider referring these patients, um, for example, we have patients who are actively relapsing, who have failed uh, some of these high efficacy MS agents, we do uh, uh, consider referring them for uh, autologous stem cell transplantation because that have been found to be 
almost in some cases curative. Um, so I think it's a very exciting field for sure. And the goal is to kind of figure out the appropriate protocol in terms of the priming and also the number of cells to transplant and also in terms of follow-up intervals and whether they need to be uh, maintained on some kind of disease modifying therapy after transplant uh, to, to further prevent disease incurrence. So it's very, definitely very exciting. And then the other stem cell transplant I mentioned in my talk, the mesenchymal stem cells, those are mainly being looked at as uh, remyelinating and neuro, uh, neuroprotective agents rather than uh, anti-inflammatory agents. What's your impression as to how many patients you have a year that you might refer for transplant? Um, I would say maybe, um, I would say maybe a handful, a handful, maybe like a handful. But a lot of times these patients some, um, may have other comorbidities that prevent them from receiving the transplant. Um, so the actual patients that do get transplanted, I would say maybe like one or two. I'm seeing a synergy here, though, between <laughs> Dr. Mm -hmm. Evans, <laughs> yeah. who does the transplants, and Ginny. So maybe you guys can do some uh, some work together. No, well, I'll just mention in passing that, you know, I've had a personal interest in this in, for many, many years. We, we yeah. held the first international symposium when I was at UMass on uh, the use of uh, transplant for the treatment of rheumatologic disorders, and that crossed the whole gambit. But by that time, rheumatoid arthritis and lupus and uh, MS. But the difficulty has always been in this field that there have been a great reticence for sending patients to aggressive therapy with the new immunomodulators that keep coming out. So every year there's another drug, and now there's the microbiome, of course, that challenges the place of something that has potential morbidity and mortality, like auto or, and let alone allo transplants. So uh, I think it's a, a very difficult uh, calculation to pick the right patients to do this, especially with competing protocols for these uh, patients uh, with more exciting sort of specific immunomodulatory techniques now. Um, so it's, uh, I, I've always sort of weighed the risk benefit of trying to do this here and I've never been impressed that we've had enough patients that would really justify really moving forward. You know, I think I will mention again, there is a huge microbiome expertise here and uh, a PO1 that is supporting the whole uh, group in the MSRB. This is something that I would highly recommend uh, to your attention. Uh, you know, it, your, your clinic of patients could easily uh, be a corollary study for many of the things that they're doing in the center, even just collecting samples from these people uh, longitudinally and trying to have clinical correlations with this. So I, I highly, highly recommend a discussion in that route. Definitely. Yeah, happy to collaborate with anybody who's interested. We do certainly have a wealth of patients here who are interested in trials, and that's what I'm trying to get started here um, as part of the MS Clinic's future or, or, uh, goals and or, uh, orientations. So. Happy to talk to anybody who may be interested in collaborating. Jenny, thank you so very, very much. Uh, it was a great presentation. I think I learned a lot that I didn't know, and you you did a great job uh, uh, reaching all of us uh, with a lot of the different therapies and even preventative stuff with statins and vitamin D. So fantastic presentation. Does anybody have any other questions for Jenny, or are we going to let her go and get to work? All right, everybody, thank you for your time and attention. All right, thank you, thank guys. You everybody. Thank, thank you, Dr. You. Kruger, and thank you, Dr. Fang. We sure do appreciate it.